quiet, cozy log cabin deep in the woods. The very thought stirs a deep-rooted desire, our primal craving to exist in the wild. I've seen more backcountry cabins than I can recall, both spacious and small, some well-maintained, but many more in ruin. Some have nearly been reclaimed by the land altogether. There have been cabins that were expected, and others that appeared like a mirage in the middle of nowhere. But on this trip, I'm seeking a cabin so monumental that it became a piece of history. A structure so remarkable that its builder became legend. A cabin so grand that it could only be called a castle. It's day one of my week-long trip to find this cabin, but as I set out for my access lake to find a man's legacy in this wilderness, a much older history comes into view. Traces of the people who inhabited the land for millennia before a homesteader came with his dream. They didn't build castles, but left a much more subtle mark on the land. These pictographs stand as a reminder of the people who have sustained human life here, passing down their culture through centuries. Sadly, the castle's builder did not get the chance to do the same, as his amazing but ultimately tragic story will tell. The trip begins on Devil's Gap Lake, though you won't find that name on many maps, and this is the Devil's Gap. It's found in northern Ontario, about 50 kilometers north of Quetico, but more on the map in a bit. It was fall, as you can see from these golden tamarack, and the days were getting short. So after a full day of travel, there were only a couple hours of daylight left, and the only thing to do was to find camp. A month earlier, the area was hit by severe wind, so a lot of potential sites were covered in blowdown, and there was a lot more of that to come. Eventually, a viable site turned up. Site number one, exciting route, lots of points of interest, great campsite, and a treat. No portages to get here, but an incredibly quiet and peaceful lake. End of the season, I'm in my glory. Starting this trip on a new moon, so the stars should be great tonight. Nothing like sunrise on a cold morning. It was a very chilly night. Frost and a much needed fire tea on the way. Ended up being a great camp for night number one. Very happy with it. Just a bush site, no established sites on this lake. 
and I'll be heading down that way before too long. Lots to do today. What a morning. One of the best I've had all season, although I'm probably biased given the warmth of the sun and how cold it is right now. Got a huge pan of black bean and hash brown mix with cheese and onion for a big breakfast burrito. Look at the size of this baby. Those little tiny baby burrito or tortillas drive me crazy. Why do they even make them that small? Can't get anything in them. But this will keep me going for a while. Today's probably my biggest day. I'll give you a look on the map in just a moment. So here's the plan for this trip. I'm in Turtle River, White Otter Lake Provincial Park in Northern Ontario. And according to the map, I am here. I always laugh when I see maps that have that. Obviously this was designed to be a, a plaque, a mounted plaque here. But I am actually over here in Devil's Gap Lake and I intended to get to Nora Lake but the forestry roads were a mess, didn't happen. So I've got an 840 meter portage just to get to Nora Lake where I hope to start the trip and I'll have to do that on the way back out, but it was totally worth it for this lake and the pictographs. So the plan is to go from Nora Lake over to Half Moon and down to this huge bay off of White Otter Lake. That's the biggest one on the trip. The White Otter Castle is there. Can't wait to get there, but that's a few days away. And then I'll go around some small lakes and the Turtle River back up through here, back to the car. That's the route. On my way, clouds are coming in and the wind's picking up, so I'm glad I got a bit of sun to warm up this morning. Be at the portage in about 60 seconds. Relieved to see that the trail's in good shape since I've got to do it both ways. Beautiful big pines and just a little light clearing work with a folding saw. Look at this giant white pine. Okay, halfway with the second load. Into Patricia Lake, nice walk in the woods there, beautiful pine. And this lake is not too big, so be at the next portage sooner than I'd like. The wind has really picked up now and it has become quite a cold day. And the wind played a big factor on where I chose to start this trip. 
I wanted to start from the north, otherwise I'd have the wind in my face most of the way. You can also start from the west. You can start up here in Ignace, but you can see it's just Portage City up there if you want to do that full distance there. And you can come in from the bottom, which would be the most convenient, really. But yeah, the wind would have been a terrible all trip from that direction. So, put in that extra little portage just now. And I should get to ride the wind a fair bit on this trip. trail into Nora Lake is looking great. And it passes three small ponds full of gold and tamarack. It looks so beautiful in fall. Into Nora Lake. This is where I hope to access. So everything I've done today plus the next two hours of paddling is where I hope to start, but it's been a nice stretch, so it's all good. Lake's looking beautiful here. So I was wrong back there. There was one more portage, one bonus portage. Now I'm in Nora. Amazing rock formations all over this lake and Nora is probably going to be home for the night because there's only about two hours of daylight left and if I jump into the next portage then it's going to be a long day. So that's alright, I'll make it up tomorrow. Biggest criteria for a campsite right now is morning sun, so an east facing view it makes all the difference when it's about freezing when I wake up. Sun just busted through, feels amazing. It makes this sight look even more alluring. Seems pretty perfect. As long as there's someone to hang the hammock, and there almost always is. Aha! Uh -huh. Thought so. Beautiful. Exposed shoreline like this got hit hard by that wind. Just look at this. And blowdown is common in the Boreal Forest, but you can tell a lot of it's still green, so it's all quite new. Got a great spot for the hammock here. Of all camp chores, the one I find most tedious is inflate and deflate my pad and roll it up especially. So, to avoid that, I've started to just leave it inside the hammock and then I just roll it all up, kind of like a bed roll, and stuff it into my pack at the bottom. By the time I put everything else on top of it, it's pretty crushed down, so the difference in volume isn't very big. It saves me that task. Alright, time for dinner. I'm starving. into a beautiful evening. Got some garlic naan toasting up there. Pot of chili. Can't wait. Despite the slow progress so far, the route would bring me to my destination within the next two or three days. The cabin I was bound for is known as White Otter Castle. It was built by a man named Jimmy McEwitt and completed around 1914. While it's famous for its size, there's much more intrigue to this wilderness mansion than its dimensions, and it's hard to say if it's more bizarre how he built it or why. 
Why would anyone build such an impractical structure alone in the middle of nowhere? In my trip planning, I learned about his motivations, and they boiled down to two themes. To prove someone wrong, and to prove to a woman that he was worthy. But I needed to see the castle with my own eyes before I could really understand the question. What's truly baffling is the claim that he built the castle completely on his own, and with no roads to get materials to the remote location, no machinery, not even horses for the brute strength required to hoist the massive pine logs. All he possessed was the bush savvy of an experienced homesteader. Cool, clear morning in the Canadian wilderness. You gotta love it. Great start to day three. Up in good time, just having quick granola because I gotta get going and make good progress today to make up for the fact that it's day three and I'm starting where I hoped to access on day one. So yeah, and today and tomorrow are the nicest days of the trip according to the forecast. After that, it gets m maybe less nice. So I'd rather make my big days today and tomorrow. I'm all set to get going. Here's the plan for today. I'm camped there on Nora Lake. Short paddle over to this portage, a longer one, perhaps two, into Half Moon Lake. Two short portages on the Turtle River into Anne Bay, which is the size of a large lake on its own, and then through White Otter Lake, which is about 30 to 40 kilometers of paddling with no portages, which would be lovely. And then I'll continue up into here, but that's the plan for the next couple days. So in trip planning for this route, I found lots of resources, but no real good detailed map. I've got like this high level overview, there were trip write-ups. So I kind of made my own on, I keep topo maps on my phone. GPS can be used offline. It's not dependent on signal. And here I've got three potential portages into Half Moon. Either a portage over to this large pond and another one there. That I don't want to do because it's long. Or similar thing but into a small pond with slightly shorter ports. Or one big long one. All I found sort of hints or clues on online. So I'm going to have to find which one exists and hopefully it's the shortest one. Typically it would be, and I'm pretty sure it's going to be the middle option because if you look at the contour lines, the, the top and bottom options go over hills. People don't usually like going over hills, so we we'll call it the middle one. No sign of that first trail. There's some debris there, orange stick, but uh, no, it's not marking anything. Not that I can see anyway, but that's good. I didn't want to see anything here. And look at these root mats. I was actually supposed to be camping in this area during that wind event, and I delayed my trip by two days. And I'm really glad that I did, because it would have been ferocious. I never get tired of looking at rock. Does that make me boring? I also never tire of sunsets and sunrises. I like talking about weather. I'm a simpleton. Trail was clearly marked. Looks like it's in great shape. And based on where it starts, I'm assuming it's going to take me to that pond, but it could shoot straight across. Either works. Got some work to do on the way back. Beautiful pond, white pine, golden tamarack, and super quiet and secluded, but not a day for stopping early, so moving on. Into Half Moon Lake on this beautiful beach, and I'm really happy to be here because the next 48 hours look gorgeous and very little portaging. And there's something right around the corner there I want to check out. Right after, I whip up a little peanut butter and honey wrap. 
Here it is, folks. Just about to come into view. White Otter Castle. Kind of underwhelming. Nah, I'm pulling your leg. This is a sauna, and I'll show you why it's here in a sec. It's an outpost camp. Quite a nice one. Boats are pulled up for the season, so I don't think they're expecting anyone for the remainder of this year. Nice pile of logs. That gets me a little excited for some winter camping. But it's kind of gross to think about that on a beautiful day like today. Nice Kevlar canoe. Oh yeah, very nice. And here's some free advertising for this company. And in exchange, hopefully they won't mind me just taking a quick peek in here. I won't touch anything. Very nice. Okay. Well, there's a warm-up cabin for the trip. Can crusher. That's how you know it's a professional operation. I love these cabins. They just have such a good vibe to them and make you think of happy times. Wilderness and fish fries, beers with buddies. But it's a profoundly different experience from the cabin I'm going to see on this trip. Hopefully tomorrow. For now it's south on Half Moon Lake, up the Turtle River, a couple short portages there, very short, and then I'll be into White Otter Lake. At the first short portage, very scenic in here. There was actually a portage from Nora to White Otter Lake and I'm glad I'm taking the long way because it's quite nice. Some good sized bass in the Ooh. <laughs> good sized bass in the river here. This one's pretty strong. Interesting to get a good look at it. Oh that's a pretty big smolly. Wow. My hand's good and wet. Wow, that is a slab. Look at that. Just tall. Thank you. Well, that was just the sweetest thing. I thought I had another portage into this lake. Perfect little channel there. Just enough water to get by. Come up to another potential point of interest on one of Kevin Callan's maps. He has White Otter Lake featured and I have campsites all over the place on this lake, which is nice. And on his map, this was identified as a prisoner of war camp. Now appears to just be a really nice campsite. 
But I wonder if there are any relics. Some dimensional lumber here. Well, I can't find any signs, but what a fantastic campsite now. Across to the east side of the lake to check out this place. There was an eagle right there, spooked him off the spot, and it turned out to be a phenomenal sight. Look at this red pine, it's got sunset and sunrise view, and the water clarity here is something else. Cliffs over there, more in the distance, and fire pit. Surprisingly unused fire pit. Just losing the sun. I've got a calorie bomb dinner tonight. Hash browns, onion, cheese, bit of ketchup. Greasy. Oh, that's better. I'm washing it down with some boiling hot mint tea and some scotch. It helps clear out the, the arteries, kind of like Drano through pipes. Still have to set up the hammock, but perfect amount of time. This came up exactly the right time after such a great day on the Turtle River. Cloud nine. Seriously, life doesn't get better than this. White Otter Castle was now within striking distance, and the anticipation was building. This piece of history is now over a hundred years old, but of course, the First Nations history here runs back thousands of years. White Otter Lake and the Turtle River are known for their pictographs, like the ones I saw at Devil's Gap. Often these locations are not publicized because of their cultural significance, so I had no coordinates for any of these sites, but the park indicates that there are 37 within its boundaries and 23 on White Otter Lake alone. I would just have to keep my eyes open. Thick dew and fog this morning for day four. My shelter is all dewy and wet, so hopefully I'll get a chance to dry it out today because tomorrow and really the rest of the trip looks like I might not see the sun again. Anyway, at least it's warmer than predicted. It says zero on my forecast, but it's definitely not zero. There's some pretty decent bass hanging out right here in front of camp.
Fog's burning off. Getting a little dry and in time on the hammock. Let's have a look at the map. So I'm camped on the end of that point there in Ann Bay. It's about 32 kilometers around the route I had planned to get to White Arter Castle there. I think those might be just the warm-up cliffs based on what I saw in the distance yesterday. And there's just an incredible rock right in front of me here, towering. Pines growing on top of it. Okay, here we go. No doubt about these ones. Cal in, in his book says that there are several pictograph sites on White Otter Lake. So I'm, I've been expecting them. Turtle. I debated not coming over to these cliffs. It was a fair detour. So glad I did. That's the first turtle pictograph I've ever seen here on the Turtle River system. Wonderful. If you ever see pictographs, never touch them with your hands. The oil on your fingers can apparently degrade them. Those beautiful rays. Just about to clear Ann Bay, and it just illustrates how huge this lake is. Just this section took all morning, so hopefully I can still make it to White Otter Castle today. The cameraman in me really wants to because I'll have afternoon, evening light on the castle instead of tomorrow in the shade with potentially rain, so much harder to film tomorrow. Really want to get there today. Taking a quick peanut butter and honey wrap break here. Well used site, looks like a shore lunch spot, but a pretty nice site otherwise. Views to the north and south on the sandy beach, but a lot of installations. Not too bad though.
crossing over to Big Island now, which is more or less in the middle of White Otter. And I'm just trying to hammer out this distance. It would be really nice to split this day into two days. This lake is giant. You could easily spend several days here. But I just want to get to the castle. That's what it's all about right now. I feel almost certain I missed a pictograph there, but can't see it, don't have time to look. The clock's ticking on golden hour for the castle. That was a long paddle, but I'm finally almost there. Final kilometer, I can see it right over there. Just a little bit of it through the trees. Gonna have serious claw tonight, but it was worth it, I think. Just enough daylight left to film this thing. I'm so glad I'm here. It has such a presence. It's a little spooky actually. I'm at a loss for words as I look around the castle. Imagine trying to build this alone in the middle of nowhere with no machinery or road access. Maneuvering 37 foot logs weighing up to 2,000 pounds and fitting the dovetails using only counterweights to lift the loads. A quote here sums it up. As Jimmy talks, I realize that this is no ordinary backwoodsman, but a man of rare intelligence, capable of adapting the principles of counterpoise and leverage so that the manipulation of the ponderous logs became a comparatively simple task. And then there were the windows, and odds and ends that couldn't be fabricated in the bush. Jimmy had to portage these between 40 and 80 kilometers from the nearest towns. I wonder how many he broke along the way. As I peruse the plaques and witness the work, my sense of awe swells. After McEwitt's death in 1918, the castle didn't maintain itself. 
Without emergency restoration in the 50s to stabilize the structure and replace the roof, Jimmy's legacy would be rotting into the ground alongside his grave. In the 80s, the Friends of White Otter Castle was formed to continue the extensive work needed to keep this landmark in good repair. The story on the third floor is where his life becomes somewhat tragic, at least to me. It speaks to his remarkable life as a homesteader, eventually selling all he had to chase a gold rush, only to lose it all and wind up on White Otter Lake in 1903, living in a shack. But James McEwitt was resilient. Much of the historical accounts for his motivations for building this place are chalked up to one moment. A childhood scolding where someone told him, you'll never do any good and you'll die in a shack. Decades later, a journalist visited the castle, and McEwitt famously told him, You couldn't call this a shack, could you? It's easy to call this his motivation when the records are limited, but I'm not sure I buy it. I don't believe a childhood scolding provides the motivation for a man in his 50s to go to such efforts. And consider that these plaques can't even confirm when he started building the castle, so certainly not everything is known about Jimmy's story. And I can only annoy historians when I add my own speculation here, but in my research prior to the trip I found mentions of another motivation that to me explains much of what I'm seeing. His desire to attract a woman to share his life with. It's known that Jimmy made efforts to find a wife, and he understood the obvious fact that if all he had to offer was a shack in the bush with an aging man, he wouldn't have many takers. But the king of this castle never did find his queen. Reading the next plaque, I'm picturing this slight and kind 60-year-old man completing this remarkable achievement alone. What I've learned about joy is that it's best shared, and I don't think the odd local or passerby in this wilderness would have sufficed to share such a dream coming to fruition. And then there's the circumstances around his death. He drowned while netting fish in the lake, only a few short years after getting the roof on the castle. It's sad that he should die in such an accident, but moreover, that seems like far too short a time to enjoy the fruits of all his labor. However, you could also say he got to finish his dream before he died, and he certainly lived an exciting life. It's just that the more I learn of Jimmy's life, the more I'm rooting for him. The more I wish he had found that partner to share this spectacular home with. How can you not get attached to such a beautiful expression of love, whether that was love unrequited or just a labor of love? And how many of us have wished for a life in the wild with our soulmate? It's no wonder so many people have related to his dream. There's also the tragedy that so many great artists have suffered when their work is only wholly appreciated after death. But then again, who among us could ask to have our life's work so worshipped as this? Looking at all the historical records, the countless visitors, and the significant efforts to keep Jimmy's dream alive, I'm sure his heart would soar to know what he created is so loved. And perhaps he does know. There's still a fourth story to see, and that's the peak of the tower. Every good castle needs a lofty tower. From here, Jimmy could survey the land and watch for game and people moving through it. Looks like that ship has sailed, but I have to imagine Jimmy would like it this way. I'm speechless. To be honest, I don't really care about human buildings very often. This is mind-boggling. I was skeptical about all the things I had heard about it coming into this. The fact that someone could build this on their own and move these enormous logs. This is the tower, so it's the smallest, but also the highest. It's, it's really hard to fathom. What an accomplishment. Just amazing. One funny thing to me is how many windows there are, which would have lost a lot of heat in winter. And Jimmy was an experienced homesteader. You would think that would be a major consideration, but he looked past those utilitarian factors. OK. 
can't imagine how much it costs to upkeep this place, not to mention hold the liability, which no one wants to do anymore, so I'm so glad that someone is friends of White Otter Castle. And the park system to some extent, I think. Just enough daylight to experience that, and I'm so glad I did. Pretty blown away, actually. But go ahead and find camp, because it's getting cold and pretty dark. On Kevin Callan's map, there was a campsite marked on this point. I'm not seeing it, but it could just be the low light. But with the hammock and the stick stove, almost anywhere can be camp. So, it looks nice in there. This will do. Yeah, this is great. Canoes turned over for the rain. Beautiful red pine for hammocking. Worked out nicely. got in the hammock. Feels like it's 3 a.m. It is 9.05. But that was a very full day and another good one. We'll see what tomorrow brings uh, with the weather and I'll make a game plan in the morning. Day five. It's been cool and rainy this morning as expected, and the trip's been go, go, go so far. Barely enough time in the day to do everything, so decided to slow it down today. I'm going to stay here. Slept in a little while it was raining, and I've got lots to check out on this lake, so it's nice to have some extra time here. There's a hill on this small island that I want to check out and have a look at. And just noticed something this morning, a, a dead bird. I'll give you a look but lots of points of interest on this lake, so it's worth sticking around. So, never, never come across this before. I'm sure it is dead. Yeah. Oh, I know it's sad to see a dead bird, but it looks like it died peacefully. A little hawk. I'm not sure what, what kind, but, uh, yeah, I've never got to look at a hawk like this. That's kind of cool. Almost looks like a peregrine, but I don't know my my hawks or birds all that well, so I'll have to look it up when I get home, but it's beautiful. Just in peace. burial. So there is a campsite here, I just couldn't see it last night. Though it looks very seldom used considering how close it is to the main attraction, which is just across the bay, the castle. I'm just over here, and I'm gonna walk up this hill and have a look. It's a pretty nice view actually. 
I'm sure Jimmy would have come up here at times. Part of the reason he said he built that that tower was for a lookout so you could see people coming, see animals moving to hunt or trap. turned into quite a beautiful day in the end. So much for that forecast. The castle is right ahead of me. I'm on this island right here and there's supposed to be a prisoner of war camp on either side of it and then an old ranger cabin on the north side. So I'm gonna see what I can find. Hopefully it's a bit more substantive than the first prisoner of war camp. So the information I had suggested that the prison of war camp was here. There's no way a camp would have been established here. It's a huge jumble of rocks with a ridge behind. So that's the purple dot there where I am. Then there's the uh, ranger cabin beneath that castle and another prisoner of war camp down by the campsite. So I'm gonna carry on. I really don't think there's anything here and gods of me finding it if I don't have like a really good hint as to its location. And Nil. So the ranger cabin looked equally inhospitable, just a jumble of rocks. But just to the south of it is this beach, which looks like a more likely spot for a camp, so I'll have a snoop around. So I see nothing at all, except for this pile of sticks, which is really kind of spooky. None of them are sawn off, they're all broken. If it was sawn off, I would be like, okay, humans did this. Why is this here? It's just weird. Really it's spooky. So I'm holding out for these three building points on the old Tapu map. That's my best bet at this point. At the end of the speechy point is a campsite with a waterfront dining table and the first relic. This is definitely not of this era and it weighs a shocking amount. Oh my goodness, I can barely lift that. No idea what that's for. Jackpot. Relics of all kinds. Steel cable, steel rod, all sorts of scrap, oil drums. But what was this is the question. Let's see if I can get any answers. Wow. Look at that pile. Jeez.
Looks like maybe a wall back here, what's left of it. Well, I think this is a logging camp for sure. Perhaps a prisoner of war logging camp. Oh, these things are just unbelievably heavy. Anybody home? This is so weird. The dead hawk at camp this morning. And now there's a hare right there, just huddled down, trying to blend in with the rocks, which he did quite well. But it's shocking he hasn't run. He's right there in that jumble of rocks by this campsite. The hare looked like it just saw a ghost, which is an eerie thought as I approached Jimmy's castle again. And I had a really spooky thought last night as I was setting up camp in the dark on the island over there. You can see the castle, and I imagine a light turning on in the top of the tower. Ooh, that gives me shivers. I had to come back for another look. Yesterday was so rushed, and the one thing I, I really can't get over, still the windows. Not only the heat loss, but they had to be portaged in here from Ignace on the rail line. 16 portages, including over the height of land, alone, I don't know, that one I just find hard to fathom. There were the forestry teams that would come in here with horses, and I wonder if they could have played some role in it, but I don't know, according to history, he did it. And then of course there's the size of it. Most trappers have small cabins with one small window, because when it's 30 or 40 below in the winter, there's no more precious commodity than heat. A lot of the write-ups on Jimmy will cite his conversation with that journalist who he told that uh, you'll die in a shack and you'll do no good basically and he had to build this to prove him wrong but no I, I think he probably told the journalist that somewhat tongue-in-cheek and clearly the the reason for building this was to attract a woman that dream sadly never came true it's really tragic when you think about it that he built this enormous mansion to attract a woman and ended up drowning in a fishing net and living his life alone Just signed the logbook, which I forgot to do yesterday in my hurry. And the last person to sign it was three weeks ago. And that's the beauty of late season trips. I had this place to myself, which has been a privilege. Seems like I have the lake to myself. And when I'm alone on trips, and I'm pretty certain there's no one within earshot, I like to sing camp songs. One of them is Wild Goose. And the final verse, I was just singing it, and it reminded me of Jimmy. Here's what it says. I've worked in the bush and spent money in town. I'd like to get married, but I can't settle down. At the last portage, when I'll pack no more, let me fly with the wild goose high over North Shore. Getting breakfast going under the tarp this morning. Rained a fair bit last night, much to the surprise of my weather forecast.
all set to head out. Just got to pack up the tarp. It's cold, drizzly, and there's a headwind. So yesterday would have been the better travel day in the end. Sometimes basing your trip around the weather forecast on the SATCOM can do more harm than good. And I just happened to be reading something about this. This book is hilarious. I was cackling out across the lake this morning when I couldn't sleep. I was reading it and it just was talking about weather. And it says, I do think that of all the silly, irritating tomfoolishness by which we were plagued, this weather forecast fraud is about the most aggravating. It forecasts precisely what happened yesterday or the day before and precisely the opposite of what is going to happen today. Yeah. Very, very funny. Three British guys taking a canoe trip on the Thames in England. And I'm sure it's all fictionalized, but it is funny. My mom found it for me at a thrift shop. And I made an update to the route, and it makes even more sense with the weather today. I'll give you a look. So I'm just off the edge of this point on a small island there on White Otter. And I plan to do a couple portages out this way on the Turtle River system. And then take two kilometers of creek travel into this lake to eventually get me back up this way. But that just sounds like a massive wild card, and if it fails, which seems likely with the water levels, then I'd have to do those portages back and come up all this way, so it just seems like a potentially ugly way to end this trip. So I'm just gonna go straight up the gut here, four portages, uh, five portages, gets me back to my access lake. And I was so impressed with the little part of the Turtle River that I saw that I plan to come back and do that full route in the future down this way. So I'll be back for that section anyway. I'll see it then. Glad to have that paddle done. Wind picked up pretty good. There's a beautiful white pine campsite here. Some nasty blowdown right across where the fire pit is. And this rotting table. A gorgeous view. Saying goodbye to White Otter. Some clearing work to do as usual. Pretty bad at this end. Small folding saw. Wouldn't come on a trip like this without it. Onward. So after that first portage this morning out of White Otter, I hammered out the following four and just powered my way back to Devil's Gap Lake here, my access lake. So that feels amazing. Portages are done and it is still super overcast, but according to the forecast, it is supposed to get really clear. So I should have one more night of stargazing here. past the camp from night one already, so I'm looking for something different tonight. And all that portaging is hungry work. Can't wait for a big dinner.
Here's the view for the final night. The sun's finally just breaking through over there. I'm hoping I get a little bit of that because it's gotten quite cold. I'm tucked away back in there and it's time for much needed dinner. Improvising dinner tonight based on what I've got left in the barrel and what I feel like. Got it some scotch left. Cheers. Great trip. So tea is definitely a priority too. Quesadillas, baby. Smell exquisite. Really, these are a lot like the burritos I normally make, but it allowed me to dump everything I had perishable into here, including all my cheese. And it looks really good. I don't know why I've never done it as a quesadilla before. Fantastic. I was so hungry. Chilly one this morning. Cold this morning yet, yeah, that's for sure. There's actually a thin film of ice all over the canoe. And that wasn't quite in the forecast. The forecast was also predicting quite a bit of rain today and now it's supposed to be brilliantly sunny. <laughs> and it looks like that'll be true once this fog burns off. I can see blue sky. So it's tough to head out. It looks like it's gonna be a beautiful day and this is probably the end of my season, but it was Fascinating to see the way people left their mark on this land with the castle and the pictographs and this place left its mark on me too. I'm sure I'll be back for the Turtle River and to bring Aaron to see that castle. Yeah, lots to come back for. So Great trip and I'll have to soak up this paddle because it's probably my last one of the season. I've got a wedding to attend in a few weeks and I gotta check my calendar but I believe I'm the groom so gonna be busy but it's been a wonderful season and this is a perfect misty morning to close it out cold temperatures on the way snow it's like it'll be ice before too long uh... As I got on the road, I savored the precious sense of peace that comes after a week in the canoe, and it was indeed my last paddle of the season. Just a few weeks later, I got to marry my wilderness queen, so it was sort of a funny trip to experience right before the wedding, and it made me that much more grateful that I found the person to share my wilderness dreams with. Though I can't help but feel guilty that all I had to do to find her was make an online profile, while McEwitt built a log castle for a woman who never came. Having seen Jimmy's vision for myself and giving it much thought in the months since, I became quite attached to his story and found myself wishing that he could have had a second shot at finding her. But for whatever love Jimmy missed in this life, it's comforting to know that he's gotten so much more in the decades since. May he forever remain the king of his wilderness castle. <laughs>